Um, so we, this session is on the live stream uh, on HowlRound. Uh, so functionally what that means for everyone here is just make sure you have a mic when you're talking. There are a lot of mics around, so it shouldn't be hard, but uh, I know that might be feel a little cumbersome, but it's important so that people can hear the conversation. Um, so thanks for coming to this breakout session. Um, and I thought we could start, uh, if you heard me talk, I talked about the idea of community narrative and how we measure um, the stories that get told about a place or the stories that we tell ourselves about our own places. Um, and it, it would be super interesting to me if we just started by sharing if people have ideas or parts of their project that they feel like are about narrative or uh, if you certainly if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those, but I'm kind of anxious also to hear about um, all of your work. So is there anybody who wants to to get started with some thoughts? Um, that's that's my friend. Okay. No, I don't know why that's like that. <laughs> <laughs> Your imaginary friend. You specifically asked about uh, narrative in the project. I don't think that's a huh? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I'm happy to share the, the narrative of ours. I don't, I don't, is this my question? No, I don't think it's a huh? Thank you. Uh, and ours is a narrative of uh, pushing relentlessly on the city to do what was right for the community. We took a 30,000 square foot uh, parking lot that the Seattle Police Department used, surrounded by a razor wire fence right next to massive transit investments. And it had a police, uh, the police department there, and of course all the, the city and union issues around that. And over 13 years and through two neighborhood plans, the neighborhood specifically called out activating that space. Um, and it took us four uh, city mayors to get there, but we finally got them to allow us to, we're developers, to redevelop the space as affordable housing and art space. Um, but it was only by reframing the project as a win for the arts. Uh, the first decade it was about affordable housing and when we brought in the arts as, as uh, not, um, a needy issue, not as something that was holding out his hand and asking for money, but as a way to activate space. Suddenly the elected officials got it. So it was that, plus marching down to City Hall with the Chamber of Commerce, the Community Council, the head of a couple of arts organizations, and all showing up with a unified voice and saying, this is a community priority for us. So framing it both as a win for the whole community and not about our desire to develop more property uh, was was finally the narrative that got the city's attention. That's two <laughs> <laughs> such a fun name. Um, I think that <laughs> I think that's uh, super interesting to think about how sometimes narrative is about finding the big win for the community or finding the big sort of inflection point. Um, for us, it was much more about how do you create lots of little opportunities. Uh, that together make up a narrative. Um, but I think those are both sort of common, those are two different but both common sort of approaches or community challenges. How do you create the sort of big point of pride and then how do you create ongoing repetition of a, of a narrative or of an opportunity? Leslie. I, I sort of want to bring it back to what you were saying up there because I think we all know how to tell our stories Whereas what I thought was so compelling about what you said in particular, but also your colleagues, was that you had visual numeric narratives, results-oriented narratives. And in your case in particular, you took the kind of data that I used to work in marketing, is very familiar to people who do marketing campaigns, but not something, right, impre media impressions is not something that's usually associated with arts projects. So you sort of found another source of data to validate your results and create your narrative of what is success. And I think that, I mean, I think that was where Liz was kind of pushing all of us, which is how do you create a narrative of results? Um, and what data do you draw on in a world where there isn't a sort of blueprint for data? You know, I mean, if we were all doing ad campaigns, right, it'd be really easy. When I, when I used to do ad campaigns for a high tech company, super easy to measure and compare to previous ad campaigns, really hard in our world to come up with a commonality that, I'll put Susan on spot, Susan the funder, no, no, the, you know, sort of how 
you know, unless Susan gives us a template and we, you know, scroll into a template from a funder, then how do we all measure results? So I'm sort of interested in that results-oriented narrative and how people. Do people have other examples of places where you found, like, from another sector or sort of a set of data that you didn't know existed before? Uh, my name is Bob, and I'm executive director of Modesto Art Museum. Our program is Building a Better Modesto in response to the livability issues in Modesto. And we, we created, in some way, a new narrative for the city, but we did it based on data that we discovered that had, people had overlooked for many generations, and that is that Modesto had a real uh, design heritage, especially in architecture, from the 1930s to the 1970s, and this was a narrative that had been forgotten, even though it was published in many books over the decades, it just was forgotten. So we dug that up and created a, a new narrative uh, of Modesto as a design, design city, a city interested in design, a city that's known for its architecture. We built an architecture festival around that. The first year about 200 people came, last year we had 5,000 real life people and 20,000 people online. It was nine days and 100 events. Uh, we've got architecture tours that you can download. and So there's this whole uh, new narrative. And one of the ways that I have measured our success is that in the media now, in this, the last architecture festival, uh, Via Magazine referred to Modesto as a design hotbed. <laughs> and uh, I wasn't there, but somebody told me that when they were on Amtrak going through Modesto, when they got to Modesto, the conductor said, next stop is Modesto, a city known for its mid-century modern architecture. I consider those signs of success because we're changing not just the, the narrative within the city, but in the surrounding area, and I took that as being very important. But we're, I know we're, another sign of success is that we put online uh, three <coughs> architecture tours that you can download either to your m device or you can print them out, they're, they're just PDFs. And we keep a track of how many people download them. And you know, we were, we were getting respectable numbers, but during September of last year, during the Architecture Festival, more than 7,000 were downloaded, uh, and I, that was one of our success um, indicators. Um, the other thing that I think of in terms of mining where we find this kind of information or where, where I feel like there's a huge opportunity for us as a field to be able to articulate our value or demonstrate value is is you can also kind of reverse engineer it and look at places where people are paying to create narratives. So for us, during a big construction project like this, often a city will pay for a bunch of paid advertisements of this business or that thing is happening. Um, so we were, I didn't talk about this in my presentation, but we were actually able to take these numbers and put them up against how much the city was spending on ad space. Um, for many of the same local businesses. And it's not that one is better than the other, but we had something to anchor it to, something to compare the numbers to. Um, and so I wonder too if there are other places like that where we can look at the things that, whether it's city or other partners, are already putting resources into and see if we can measure against those things um, as an opportunity <coughs> for sustaining the relationship or, or continuing the work. And this isn't an example of that, but you're an example maybe of the earlier thing, which is our work is, <clears throat> we, we don't have an enough structure to have a, anybody really in charge of marketing. And our, I'm a member of an art group in Anchorage that calls itself the Light Brigade. And we all our work is time-based and site-specific and one time only. And we've kind of discovered that um, our best marketing strategy has been to keep our plans really quiet. And that, and that has, has actually worked really well. It wasn't what we set out, it wasn't the way we set out to approach it, but, it, but it's worked. And one way, one of our goals is to just get people talking about creative placemaking and to get people in our community discussing 
what it means to live in a city that's becoming really increasingly vibrant and active around art groups going out and doing staging urban inter art interventions in the community rather sort of spontaneously. We want people to discuss that. And we're not sure where the discussion's gonna go or how to guide it, but we wanna know if they are. And so the easiest way to do that is just to track hashtags. Every time we do something, every time we have an event, every time we you know, make stage an intervention or there is one that some other art group is doing locally, you just start following it and the next thing you know, you, know, you start to accumulate these clusters of buzz that are very, very, how shall I say, quantifiable. <laughs> and and, and you, know, you just have to tie them back because they always go like this. They always have a, you know, they build, they, they, they plateau, and then they, they f fall off. And it always corresponds to the, you know, week before, the day of, and the week after. And it just makes a really beautiful flow chart. I think that's, that's super smart. And I think that, or counting media impressions, they're ways of making, you know, those are sort of proxies or ways of making a community conversation more visible. So the proxy there is that you would assume if people are talking about it on Twitter with a hashtag that there's also an in-person conversation happening that probably <coughs> follows that same arc, um, but those tools make it easier to, to show it. Yeah. We're trying to track in New London, Connecticut. It's a seaport town with ferries, transit, everybody. We want them to drive to and not keep driving through, so we're trying to do a public art project that counts like how long did you stay and did you see these shops and all of that. It's just a lot of places I work have the problem of people just driving through. Mm -hmm. So if anybody has any good tools for measuring that. <laughs> you mean measuring uh, whether people stop or measuring which piece of that do you feel like is important to measure? Um, Staying instead of driving through, mm -hmm. like you know, more people staying. So how do you measure downtown. whether you're capturing people? Yeah. I, I guess the merchants can, but there aren't that many merchants. We're in a, a process of doing a storefront program. Mm -hmm. Do you have parking meters? Do you have parking meters? Uh, they are just not functioning at this time. <laughs> Things are bad. <laughs> but I think those kinds of like again, there are proxy measurements that you could track over time about, you know, have have somebody stand outside and count how long the car is parked or, you know, count the traffic at the the highway wayside gas station versus the in-town gas station or some kind of way of, of being able to see something about there, there the traffic. There has to be a public art project in this. I just I haven't figured it out. <laughs> if anybody has any ideas, let me know. I like the idea of gas station residencies, I think. <laughs> Other ideas, questions for each other? I'm certainly not the expert here. I have one, one thing to add. I, um, I'm from the Lanesboro Arts Center in Lanesboro, Minnesota, and our town is 750 people. And so all of these big numbers and metrics and data, we, we don't have the resources right now to do that. But more importantly, it doesn't really matter to a lot of our stakeholders because they don't want to see numbers. They want to see more kids in the school district. They want to see more businesses in the vacant storefronts downtown. And so I'm just thinking like, Personally, I know that there are people who move to Lanesboro because they like the culture there. They like that we're doing stuff. They like that there's a world-class art center and theater there right in this rural um, place. And they have told me, there's this couple, they have three kids, they moved to town, and they have said, we, we wanted to come here because of what you guys are doing. And, but it's really hard to sell that, like one example, as a reason to believe in the project. So I'm wondering if anyone has any good ideas for platforms to showcase um, examples like that that really do make an impact on people. And um, I've brought this up like in talking with some of our legislatures and things, and they're really interested in that, but really showing the measurement that those types of things can make. I don't know if there's any um, similar situations or anything that you could add or help me try to figure out how best to describe our situation in things like our interim report or in um, future grant proposals to more economic-based um, projects. Do people have ideas? Anybody have ideas for Courtney? I, mean, I don't know how you would put it in an interim report necessarily, but um, I think the resources of, like I love the story of those people and being able to capture that on your iPhone and make a little movie out of it, like testimonial movie that could be, you know, and then you could transcribe that, I suppose, in a report. Um, 
and where do you think we should share that information? Maybe that's maybe that's a bigger question. Who needs to know about that, and how do we make that more visible? I guess that I mean I guess that would depend on who the audience is. I mean in terms of what you're trying to use that tool for. Is it to get more people involved? Yeah, I guess maybe it's just to bring more legitimacy to the to the project or to the notion of getting people to move there. Mm. I guess like that's that's maybe because that's the ultimate goal. We want our town to survive, and so we need more people to move there because that family brought three kids to the school district, which is incredible in a town like I grad. I, I'm from there, and I graduated of um, in a class of 25. That was my graduating class. So it's just a very interesting um, way to kind of look at how our town is surviving. So um, I think visuals, visuals are, and are, are really helpful. We need to get a new website, yeah. sexy new what website. The, what the program, or what, what do I get by moving to this city? What, mm -hmm. what's, how is my life going to be enriched? And mm -hmm. having people talk about it, showing what you're doing. Um, I mean, those are all, uh, that, that's a great way to do it, I think. Mm -hmm. I think you can also, um, you know, looking at Brian's work in Cleveland to be able to do a, a community perception survey in some ways that's an easier task in a smaller community I mean you could get a pretty significant portion of the population probably yeah, to yeah, fill yeah. out that survey and <laughs> the other asset you have in terms of um, you know sort of proximity and a more statewide community in Minnesota is you could also survey people outside of Lanesboro who live in the Twin Cities or Duluth or Mankato about their perception because mm -hmm. I feel like your work has uh, reputation that stretches way beyond Lanesboro. So to be able to to share that outwardly, but also share it with community members, I feel like that's particularly meaningful to be able to say, people all over the state know Lanesboro because of this work. They know that this is a good place to live, an, an interesting place, a place with these assets. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we've we've done a lot of work where we're both trying to, to tell the story outwardly to sort of you know, from a more marketing perspective, but also to reflect that story back for the people who are creating it, um, I think is really important. Uh, the other project that came out of um, Brian's work in Cleveland is that they did this really great postcard project that Brian showed, yeah. where they, they were, their goal was the same, to try and get people to move there. And they sent postcards to artists in New York and artists places all over the country um, that essentially were ads for Cleveland and for their neighborhood mm -hmm. that were about how affordable it was, what a great place it was, um, and it really worked. They've, they've sold those houses um, at partly because of their sort of outward reaching philosophy. Uh, hi, I'm Jessica, and I had an art place grant for the Building Imagination Center, and one of the things that we did is we brought in uh, video artists to make movies with the community, about the community. Mm -hmm. So it was a way of showing people outside of the community what we have to offer, but it was also a way to show the community itself, right. what it's already doing, and then putting those things on Facebook and on Vimeo and, and updating the Wikipedia site about our city. Mm -hmm. You know, all those things, I think, work together. Um, I'm Kimberly Van Dyke from Wilson, North Carolina with the Vala Simpson World League Park Project and kind of uh, in the beginning Michael talked about how um, in his community the value of his project it, it sort of didn't bring value to the community until they um, talked about the arts component. Well in our project it was sort of the opposite interestingly enough. Um, so uh, when our project started there were a lot of people in the community that didn't find value in the project because it was art or it was about art um, and so that we had to find um, we knew that we wanted to use the project from the beginning our intent was to use the project not only as um, having value in and of itself as the project but also we wanted to use it as a catalyst project to revitalize the geographic area around it um, and so um, we had to sort of craft the narrative around um, uh, job creation, um, business starts, uh, uh, private investment, um, and that type of thing. And so our value came really when we were st we were able to start to quantify um, all of those types of things. Which you know I'm I'm a big fan of um, collecting data that already exists. 
You know, so you can very easily pull number of building permits and value of building permits in a certain geographic area. You can very easily um, pull things like um, business licenses, how many business licenses were, were pulled. And then, um, you know, collecting other data around that that is not quite as easy. So asking your business owners to participate and give you numbers of sales from one quarter over the next, you know, from one year over the next and that type of thing. That's really where we started to get, that's when people started to wake up and say, oh, this project actually does have value because it has this reverberating effect. Um, and the other thing that I'm sort of, um, that I know is happening, but I haven't quantified it the same way that, you know, for example, Laura, you've started to quantify some of that, and um, uh, I guess it's Brian has started to quantify some of that, is I know that it has really started to change the community's perception of itself. So, well, maybe in the beginning they didn't see the value around the art, as the project sort of gained momentum and gained national attention and you have like an article in the New York Times or you get the Art Place grant and they say, oh my gosh, uh, these big funders are giving our community money for this project, it, maybe it does have value um, in and of itself and maybe it's not just the economic, you know, um, ripple effect that has the value. Um, and so then they start saying, oh my heavens, we have this asset and now we're, you know, we used to make fun of it but now we're really proud of it. Um, and it started to sort of change their own perception of their community. Um, but I haven't tried to quantify that. Um, and so I think based on this conversation, that's the next thing I need to start to measure because that's really just as important or if not more important. Um, and so I'm, thank you for sharing that. I was just gonna add to what Kimberly said about using data but also using data that's already out there. Um, so just, uh, we have many examples of, we, we run a boat, so we know exactly how many people come, right? So we're like a museum in that and not like a park. And so everyone loves our story that we went from 8,000 people in a season to 8,000 people a day. But then we have the High Line, right? So it was like, how do you compare to the High Line? Two million people. We have, so we then went and studied how many hours people spend on Governor's Island. And so, I, so when I have a conversation with someone, I say, well, we have you know, 400,000 people, but they come for about three hours. And you know, when you go to the Highland, the Highland's fantastic, I always say that, but you go for 20 minutes. So all of a sudden you're changing the story because you've gotten a different piece of data um, and, you, and you're using somebody else's data, right? The two million. So instead of the conversation being, well, that's like really nice, Leslie, you've gotten up to big whopping 400,000, it's, and I don't wanna get into that where we're only open this much, but then all of a sudden the conversation changes and then when I say, well, we're a place that people love, right? How do you quantify that? Well, if they're not going to a place they hate for spending three hours there. <laughs> but, you, but, but seriously, so because I, I know that they love it, right? Because I hear them say that, but if I just said that without then saying, but I know they spend three hours, then it makes sense as opposed to my, because you know, I think that all of us are good at telling how wonderful our projects are, right? We're passion driven, but then I really think we have to like push harder on like, Courtney, what's your story? Like, what are the numbers, right? There are numbers involved in your budget. You know what I mean? H how do you show that? And then how do you use other data? Like, how many people have gone to a performance in your community versus a theater in a bigger city versus, you know what I mean? Like, how do you construct a story with numbers in that story? And I think that then that just gives us all a lot more credibility and then, of course, as you're doing that, you also want to be able to judge the impact of your, you know what I mean? So it's telling your story, but then how did I get from point A to point B? So we try really hard. Um, and again, we haven't figured out how to quantify love, um, but we're coming up with proxies. Well, and I think that's a really good strategy of like a place to start when you think about evaluation. If you think, if you start with the place, like these are the things that I say about this project all the time, or these are the things I feel when I experience this project on the street, how do, how do I measure how do I measure those things? How do I find a proxy for love or for <laughs> community possibility? Um, which are you know those that's the thing that I talk about all the time: a sense of possibility and agency. Well, I I'm sure there are smarter people than I who do know how to measure that, but I don't. So how do you how do you pull those apart and try and find the measurable pieces of the things you already say or you already want? to demonstrate rather than someone else's measurements you know, that may or may not be relevant to you. 
Yeah, I just want to jump off of what you said there. It's, I'm, I work in the theater, and the theater is, again, one of those, okay, you can, you know, you can see how many people showed up to the theater. Um, you can survey them after and ask them what they thought or how they were engaged or what motivated them to buy a ticket or how, you know, how they were engaged with the, with the piece. But we're actually trying to think about now, at per, I'm from Perseverance Theater in Alaska, and um, what we're trying to figure out is how, you know, the, basically where does the story begin of the engagement with a piece um, and where does the engagement end? Like it doesn't begin when they show up at the theater, it actually starts before that, you know, in terms of being interested in that particular story or, and we do a lot of, um, it was funny when you were talking about narrative, we do a lot of stories about Alaska or about the people of Alaska or stories that have impact in Alaska. So those are really interesting ones to measure uh, in terms of their impact. But I'm cu really curious about, and I don't know the answer to this, but it's just something I'm starting to investigate, is how once they leave the theater and they have the conversation in the car on the way home, but what's the next thing? Does, right. it, does, it, does it impact, you know, um, uh, you know, I my play. I just directed this play by a playwright from Anchorage, and you know, she was uh, in the quilting store one of the next days, and and she heard these two women talking about the performance, and you know, she felt like she had to hide behind the the thing be the shelf because she didn't. She's like, I. But then she realized she was the playwright, and they actually don't know what she looks like, probably. <laughs> but um, but she was hearing that conversation, and so those conversations are really difficult to measure, like in terms of what actual impact does the story or the engagement that they had with the piece, you know, besides them coming back and seeing another play, but that's not really what I mean in terms of taking the story that they listened to or experienced and how does that go forth in engaging in their lives. Yeah, so it's just an interesting question. It's almost the same as love, you know, but um, yeah, it's, it's just something that, pondering and yeah I'm not smart enough to figure it out so if anybody has any thoughts on what they've done post you know activity to see what the long-range impact has been that would be cool um, I, I want to echo in on that because I often try to track changes in attitudes and behavior and I think those are really distal outcomes. Um, I've been going through this kind of soul searching with what does that mean? Um, can I really deliver on the fact that any intervention, any engagement that we are doing will lead to a change in attitude or behavior? Or will we be in existence long enough to see that or see that come to fruition? So. Um, like you, I, I'm measuring those proximal act outcomes, those things that I can measure um, right away that, you know, seeing people come back, um, repeat engagement, um, a follow-up phone call and an email, and then trying to latch those on to some other larger community goals that some of my stakeholders are uh, implementing. So with us having so many partnerships with city and county government and things around quali quality of life services, um, we're like um, our main partner is a neighborhood works um, um, community. So how can we tie into those and say that, well, well, maybe we were not the direct effect of that, but we partner with this organization in order to get there. Because I think those distal outcomes um, can be very frustrating and it could be really, um, it can slow you down to a point where you almost don't feel like you're having any success because um, in our community it's huge about uh, if you're educating students that you're contributing to 90% graduation rate at the lowest achieving high school. And it's like, how am I gonna be able to tell you that I actually did that working with a kindergartner? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's that far away. Um, but thinking a little bit more realistically about what are those proximal outcomes, what are those things that we know increase attendance rate, increase attitudes of, of engagement, coming to school when we know that you're there on a, um, they know you're gonna be there every Friday, so the kid shows up a little bit more on Fridays. These are the things that, that we have started to like, change the way that we're looking for these outcomes and then beginning to report out. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I, I want to know what's happening 10 years down the road, but I just don't know how I'm going to get that data or where it's going to live. And I think that's something really important. Um, but we can't lose hope or faith that, like, we won't get there. So I just want to say that. I think that's another, you know, another challenge of probably all of our work, is certainly for us, is that we're working within systems and ecosystems of a lot of people and a lot of challenges and it's really hard 
to draw those straight lines, yeah. like Liz said, the sort of causality piece of like, I did this and then this happened, <laughs> the end. <laughs> um, and especially when you're working on trying to sort of change whole systems, uh, that those kind of direct, you know, the logic model sort of way of working doesn't always follow. Um, I've recently become really interested in where there is existing sort of bodies of knowledge and research that we might be able to hook onto either as sort of a preamble or <laughs> or the end piece. So just as an example, there, there's a local foundation in Minnesota called the Wilder Foundation, and they've done this great body of research about how social connectedness and social bridging leads to physical health outcomes for neighborhoods. And so I've been talking with them and thinking about how do we make a, a prequel to that that demonstrates how arts and culture leads to social connectedness. And then they've already done all of the work, sure. the long-term work about how that leads to lower rates of obesity and diabetes in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. How do I connect, my, how do I just make that, um, you know, the, that train link thing <laughs> that <laughs> hooks on to, the, to, to people who've already done that kind of long-term yeah. system-based mm -hmm. uh, research. And I imagine there are other I'm sure there are other fields, other sectors that have those kinds of long-term, real academic, scientific research. What other challenges do you guys have in your work in terms of measurement in general or the idea of narrative? Where are their pressure points? Um, I don't know if this is particularly responsive. I'm Nancy Ibrahim from Esperanza Community Housing. The Mercado La Paloma is the site that we have for, we had for our Art Place grant. And the Mercado is a very unusual project by any um, understanding. But one of the most interesting and challenging interfaces has been, since we started this project more than 13 years ago, um, is the, the role that we play as the developer with individual small businesses, which are for-profit entrepreneurial um, enterprises. And one of the things that we did from the very, very beginning of our work was to create a year-long schedule of cultural events that we stimulated just to bring, start bringing more foot traffic into the space. And some of those choices were fairly arbitrary. Um, Dia de los Muertos, the Day of the De Dead, has always been a high holy day for us. But we also have, we're the only place that we know of um, north of Mexico, north of Oaxaca, actually, that celebrates the Noche de Rabanos, the Night of the Radishes, which is a uniquely Oaxacan celebration. Um, and we've done different other small um, celebrations throughout the year. The Art Place grant was specifically designed for us to elevate the concept of a cultural continuum, that the culture of South LA is no longer simply a narrative of black versus brown, as if it ever really was simply that. But it's a very, very diverse community, diversely African-American, Afro-Caribbean, diversely Latino, um, and diverse beyond those two particular groups. And one of the things that happened that we were extremely excited about that is part of our post art place and continuing measure is the fact that those six high holy days of the Mercado now that everybody will rally around have been owned by the vendors. So we were able to stimulate these in the creation of the Art Place Grant. We had the first ever African American Film Festival in the month of um, January, January, February. We had um, um, a newly partnered uh, curated show with the California African American Museum. We had Garifuna performers, um, always live dance, fixed art exhibits something that was relative to the month um, of, uh, or every two months, we would change this show with one, at least one grand performance. One of the things that happened is that our Thai um, business, which is a restaurant that has, uh, that occupies a restaurant and does a brisk business, had been on the verge of leaving the Mercado and returning to Thailand because of family issues. And because we celebrated the Thai New Year as one of our festivals, it gave them a place of ownership there. 
that they had never really realized before. And somehow the commitment that this was a place that could, in South, in South LA, where the Thai New Year would be affirmed and celebrated and, and, and claimed and developed, was something that was profoundly meaningful for that particular group. Um, each of the different um, entities has claimed a particular day that the whole Mercado will celebrate around. So the month of the Yucatan, the month of Michoacan, uh, Day of the Dead will continue to be celebrated, the Noche de Ravenos will continue to be celebrated, but now as a regular year, um, the Thai New Year Festival will be celebrated. Um, the newest member of our tribe is Asla Ethiopian Vegan, the first Ethiopian restaurant in South LA, and brilliant, brilliant food and a very charismatic and wonderful family. And they found the Mercado through our Art Place grant and fell in love with some of the performances that, that they experienced there and wanted to make it their, the home for their business as well. So these are more narrative measures of, of the success, but a lot of it has to do with how deeply invested um, these business folks are having invested everything in a business, but also getting re-energized around um, cultural manifestations that they're playing a bigger, a bigger role in. Um, so that's, that's a big part of it. I think in terms of the external narrative, I still rail in the press when I see us referred to as a food court, um, because we're a very intentional community. It's not meant with malice, and we do observe the hits of the press, even if they're not our narrative. Um, uh, but it's, it's those more meaningful um, claims of ownership and ownership stakes in the Mercado that make us feel as if uh, we've really created something with many, many deep roots. So I, I love that, and for me, it provokes this question about community ownership and how we measure that, how, how you measure people's investment in a place and their ownership or agency in a place. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have, I have a story for that. stories, yeah. ideas? <laughs> so um, my name is Boston from Perseverance Theater in Juneau, a town of 32,000 people. You can only get there by plane or boat. And um, over the years, um, there's, a, there's a story that, uh, you know, that, that um, the taxi driver was talking to some folks who had come in on the airplane and was taking them somewhere, and he kept talking about um, our theater. You know, our theater just announced they're, they're going to be doing Hamlet next year. Our theater. So the community buy-in to the, the ownership of what the theater does and what the theater is for the community is, is very large. And when you get people referring to it as our theater, um, and not something that's far away. Then there's then that's it, and you can't really measure that. But you hear these stories, and so you know those stories, and and, and those are just great, mm -hmm. great, great stories to to know that you're having the impact that you want to have on on the community, and that they are so you know entrenched in what you do, and and you know, and then you hear them vocally when you when they do something that you don't like, when you do something they don't like. Um, but because they have that ownership, it's great, you know, and, and that's, that's really wonderful. So I love that idea too, like is there a way to measure community pushback or resistance mm -hmm. as, a, as a measure of ownership? <laughs> like how do you, you take that and you're able to, uh, to demonstrate some kind of ownership? Um, do people have other examples of that? Other? Uh, our architecture festivals become very large and we encourage a, an enormous amount of uh, community participation from just about anyone. And in the beginning, I was always going out and inviting and encouraging groups to participate. Uh, but it took a real turn two years ago when I got a phone call from the almost proverbial group of little old ladies who make quilts. And they asked if they could be part of the architecture festival. They wanted to make architecture quilts. I would have, on my own, I would have never thought to invite this group to be part of the architecture festival. I wouldn't have known that they would have had an interest. But because the architecture festival has become part of the community, and, and they wanted to be part of it. So they came, and they produced the most amazing quilts that I have. I, I just couldn't believe it. it. just blew me out of the water. 
and people came from all over to see those quilts. Then we have, um, there are poets in town. And I, the same year, I got a phone call from uh, a woman who said she wanted to meet with me. And she was very secretive. And we finally met. And she said, well, the poetry community would like to be part of the architecture festival. <laughs> and I said, well, how do you envision this happening? Well, we're going to take pictures of you know, a half dozen buildings in town. We're going to put them on a, on a website. And we're going to invite poets from all over the world to write poems in response to these buildings. And then we're going to pick, we'll have a committee, we'll pick the, what we think are the, however you pick a best poem. Uh, I stayed out of that. And, and then we're going to have a poetry walk during the festival. And we'll walk from one building to the next. And if the poet's local, the poet will read his or her poem about that building. And if it's a poet from far away, somebody else will read it. And then they videotape the whole thing. And I, I would have never imagined doing that. Uh, that came completely from the community and from these little niche groups. And, and really, those are um, indicators in my mind of success, you know, what, whatever success might mean. Can make that into a real sort of quantifiable metric too. You can count up the number of disparate groups that are involved now that weren't involved before. You can map the sort of different sectors of the community that are engaged in the festival. I think that I'm hearing, you know, I hear all of you talk about your projects and everyone is so passionate and, and it's so moving to hear everybody tell the actual narrative stories of the people in their community and their response. And so I, I am also, to, I think, to Leslie's earlier point, interested in how do you how do you take that and just convert it into a number that also means something to people who are maybe more numbers driven or who need this sort of tangible thing to hang their hat on, along with the really compelling story. And I think I think it is sometimes a matter of just making a visual representation or a you know little graph how many groups were involved before and how many groups are involved now. And that's a really good proxy for, for ownership and, and engagement. And, and we, we did that because there were 36 quilt artists mm. you know, who <laughs> we could, you know, we, we do count the number of people who are involved and the number of artists who are involved. So suddenly we had 36 quilt artists, and I, I think it was 70 or 80 poets who were involved. How many hours of inspiration you, you We should count the hours of inspiration. <laughs> That's right. I would have th wouldn't have thought of that. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. We have a we have a project. It's the Ar I'm Danny. I'm with Yellow Arts in Yellow County, Northern California. We have a project that is art embedded in agriculture. And we do a, a couple of things. We do the stories, which we, thanks to an Art Place grant, we also did video, but we took it to YouTube. We didn't have to do anything special, but we also then conducted screenings. We had movie nights at Movies and Martinis, by the way, um, in our local theater and screened our movie and brought up the farmers that we interviewed and the artists that we interviewed and made them stars and walked them down the red carpet and they were like, they were laughing at first, and they kind of got into it. It was kind of weird. Um, and then at the end of that movie, we, we, um, we hit the highlights of the number of artists we touched, the number of farms we touched, the number of people that came to the festival. the number. And so we just put those numbers randomly up on the screen, and we asked people to connect them. And the first time we did it, everyone, we're not really sure, but we do it every year in some fashion take those numbers and ask people to connect them and help us understand, see if they know where the, these numbers are going. And those are the same numbers, by the way, that go in front of my county supervisor. So it's a visual, it's like a wordle with numbers, right? And it's just making sure that my supervisors know and the people who are, and my funders know that, that these are the numbers that are impacting and how they're increasing. So it's kind of a strange uh, pie chart. But by doing them in combination with the stories, with the videos, and this year we had a small grant that we got from the Rotary, the local Rotary, and um, we bought, they're not flip, flip cameras, but they're the newest version of flip cameras, 
and iPads, and we're now sending the kids out to, to do the stories. So now we're doing this cross-generational youth interview of a farmer and an artist, and then the kids are putting these stories together in their classroom. So it's digital art in the classroom, but it's also helping them learn more about their place and why this, this program is so important. So those are the ways we're trying to do it. We're trying to tweak the stories with the, with the, the numbers on top of it. I think we are uh, at the end of our time, um, but I just want to thank you all for sharing your stories and